Hi, my name is Patrick. I want to make a little monologue for a group that I belong to and post it on my wall as well. It's about what we have come to call racism. Oh boy. Um, I'm going to start by telling a story. When I was growing up in the States before before we moved, before my sister and I moved to Argentina and we continued going to schools there, uh, we used to go to a little school, a little private school right next door to us called St. Victor's in West Hollywood. And I remember um, I had a few friends. I was not exactly, I was maybe a little difficult, I uh, was hot headed or something. I, I had like best friends, but this is typical of, of children, you know, they get, they're, 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 they get married, right? You get like your best buddy and you're always with them and then maybe you have a new best buddy the following year. And um, one of my little friends was this girl, I can't remember her name, uh, but she was really dark skinned and I think, um, I think her mom was maybe single I'm pretty sure about that I mean we're talking about when I was in second grade and before I changed a lot when I went to Argentina I became like a little Argentinian boy and all my memories of childhood of my childhood now kind of start uh, when, after I got to Argentina but I have these two years these and the year of kindergarten that I have some memories and especially when I uh, of, of the States uh, uh, especially when it, it was with these little adventures, like I had another little buddy named Richard. I we used to crawl under buildings together and stuff. Um, and this girl, I can't remember her name, but I guess we were really we liked each other. We would play in school. I don't remember us playing in in the yard. I you know I have very few memories. I remember Richard always, and and then my nemesis. John, who would beat us up, or either beat me up or beat Richard up. Anyways, and what I was, I was just, what I was, what I was saying is that I think her, she, I'm pretty sure she was, uh, she had, a, I, I remember her mom, her mom, I remember her, she tied her hair back and had like a big pom-pom, uh, well, I'm not sure what you call it, like, you, you can't make a ponytail, right? But, um, you tie it all in what would be a ponytail, and then it's like a big, pom-pom in the back you know and I remember that about her and um, she loved having me over their house and they lived in the same building that another buddy of mine named Jason or no was um, yeah she lived in, they they lived in the same building which is one of the only two towers and they're still there on La Cienega um, as you pass Holloway Drive and you continue up towards Sunset on the left, there's two tall buildings, um, built maybe in the 50s, um, and they had these awesome apartments there with, with windows, ceiling to floor windows and balconies, and um, I think she lived, yeah, she, I'm pretty, you know, as I'm thinking, I remember that day going into their house and the, the hallway, and um, so I would go, and we lived around the corner on Holloway Drive, and um, she, her mom was, I think, friends with uh, a roommate, a good friend of my parents that lived in the house with us, sort of an uncle named Julio. Um, I wonder if Julio can, will see this. I, I, he would know. He would remember. I think they were either probably going out, maybe. I think they were probably going out, you know, putting two and two together now. Um, and, uh, so it was kind of Julio's doing of one, of maybe, uh, facilitating this friendship, taking it from the schoolyard, uh, to, uh, stay with, uh, my little friend and her mom and have lunch maybe or something. And, uh, her and I, uh, my, my, my friend, uh, would go into the mom's room and uh, watch TV and play on the bed and she had a, 
a, a darkly decorated bedroom. I think it was like purple. It was awesome. And I was so fascinated by people's houses. Um, you know, when you're a kid, you love going to somebody else's house. And I don't know what happened. Um, I think because something strange happened, uh, like I, I never went back. And it could be my mom. My mom, my parents were a little funny. My dad seemed like he, he had African American, Americans of African descent friends. Um, but my mom was weird, and she, you know, she liked, uh, she was anti-Semitic, and she, you know, she was, she would always talk about how Hitler was. <laughs> Anyways, you have, you have to know her. She didn't mean. She was from another era, another part of the world, and so she had these old, old school ideas about Jews, maybe about blacks, but then she faked um, being congenial and friendly to everybody, but, you know, then with her friends. But um, my dad wasn't like that. My dad probably was like that too, but he was more um, to n not want to be that, you know, like his one, he had this this um, African American that would come uh, to the restaurant all the time and, and he was his friend and I think he did the plumbing of the restaurant but you know it was like it was joke around and laugh together um, but then he showed his true colors I'm changing the subject anyways um, and so this memory stayed with me of, of my little friend and I, I always I like to think it was rain prior for some reason because Later, and in, in when I came back to America for high school, I, Rain Pryor was uh, in my same class, I think. We never met or anything, but, you know, you'd see famous kids in the hallway, and, you know, your friends would tell you, ooh, that's, you know, Nicolas Cage, you know, <laughs> like, oh, really? And he would just, you know, be busy going to the gym or something. And, um... And I remember Rain, Rain Pryor, and I think I had that thought that she reminded me. But Rain is a lot a lighter skinned, and I think this little girl was really dark. Her mom was really dark. And in any case, this idea stayed with me about how grown ups ruin what children will so naturally do. And I think all of us can um, can talk about what we've all seen in children is that when you first bring um, children together of very uh, contrasting races, you know, where they're very different in appearance, they have this wonder in their face and they just want to, they're like attracted because they see something that's interesting and they want to touch each other and they actually are inclined to want to be more friends uh, with, with that kid that looks very different. And, um, sorry, I get a little, you know, I have this thing that's put my own political correctness, which I told myself I was going to, which is what I'm going to talk about later, that I, I want to say Americans of African descent, and I think it's important to not even say, but I'm going to say why. Um, and how, um, later, and I, and how, um, somehow we ruined that. In, in other words, and I've seen tons of, tons of posts on this where, um, you know, uh, children initially, if we left it, if we left things as, as we are as children, we wouldn't know any sort of um, social segregation by races. And growing up in Argentina, I, and then coming back to the States, I was able to compare a lot. And um, so I had that advantage where I was able to see how in, uh, and then, you know, in Argentina, you, you are right next door to Brazil, and you kind of have a feel for how they are, you know, even, maybe if you don't see, maybe you don't even see all that many of them when I was a child later on, but somehow you know how they are, and then, and you could say in Latin America in general, especially if you think of Cuba and uh, Puerto Rico, Honduras, the Latino... So Hispanic Portuguese demeanor uh, is very different, and how Catholicism and the Spanish Empire and the Portuguese Empire, uh, how they went about colonialism, they brought about a different kind of of um, 
a way of going about this which adults ruin <laughs> one way or another but uh, it seems that what I would notice when I come back I can I would come back to the states is that we didn't have in South America such an issue we were more comfortable you know with saying that somebody was black or polish or 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 jewish or you know chinese was sometimes often a a way of, of affection of expressing something that you can't avoid noticing it's just one of our characteristics and so there wasn't any kind of weight associated to it and if you weren't mad and if you weren't saying something stupid like you uh um how can i don't want to say a bad word uh <laughs> in case in case they think i don't want them to take it off facebook um ff uh black of of ff you know like a cuss because you were mad at your friend and who you, you hang out together all day and you go out and pick up women together maybe even uh, but when you got into a fight, you you blurted out, you, uh, you know, FF black, you know, whatever. And um, it wasn't, the sentiment behind it was because you were angry. And then coming back to America, and then you, let's say in that case, they made friends right away and they forgot all about their, their fight. They didn't even really think of needing to apologize as having done something horrible, you know, calling somebody you bloody Polish or something like that, you know. It just happened. And what mattered more was the the, 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 the breadth of their friendship, the, the whole, the, the, the more uh, larger and broader base and force of their friendship. So this idea, this natural idea of noticing our difference as adults, not like children are able to, to not do, but as adults where it becomes laden and weighed down with negativity, it seemed that in Hispanic countries was much more innocent. And these issues, these ideologies of, of, of and, uh, expectations, social civil expectations of, uh, that have come to society through so much uh, publicity of don't be racist, you're a bad person if you da 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 da, da and no discrimination in the workplace and all sorts of messages that have been making us um, hyper aware of whether we're hurting somebody by segregation. You know, um, I'm getting ahead of myself. What I was going to say is that when I would come back to the States, I would notice that it was like an electric issue all over. You, you, there are things you could not say because you, if you said that, then you're you're saying something that you're not supposed to be saying. And that was very uh, particular to the States. It didn't happen in Argentina. It would happen only when I would come back to the States. And so I, then I would go back to Argentina because I would go visit my parents for a month and then go back to school, and I did this for, for several years. And so I was always going back and forth and comparing the two cultures. And because I already, you know, was a kid that liked psychology and sociology and was paying attention to what grown-ups talked about it, in adult conversations, and I was already kind of messed up that way as a kid, I started thinking about it and started wondering what that those contrasts meant, what this contrast meant. Um, and then I became more of a uh, sort of a self-made activist when the internet came, and I really started thinking and really started listening to how other people were thinking also and writing and talking and making uh, uh, videos and documentaries and talking about things that I myself was also starting to see. And in fact, um, if we go to our own history in the States, the, the um, for example, when pro, uh, act, proactive, uh, not policies, but uh, what do you call it, uh, social politics of of, uh, of being a, a positive affirmation and trying to integrate and busing and all that started happening because we always had this wrestling with something. But you know, as 
I go back and look at what I continue to learn in other areas, and many Hispanics now are talking about uh, revisionism and uh, the uh, black and the black legend, which, in this sense, the noun black means sort of the the uh, the rotten or the the, the bad the bad legend. Uh, the La Leyenda Negra, the black legend, uh, black legend basically refers to sort of um, a media, media for the times, propaganda. Now it is called propaganda campaign, but it was a deliberate attempt to malign the Spanish Empire through the British press and the Germans and the Italians and the French, and they all hated the Spanish because they were like sort of what America is today. They had a single currency and they were uh, bringing European culture to the whole Americas and you know the English were still trying to catch up and compete with them and they were growing and, and getting better fast, very fast, but it started off to where uh, they had they first had to overcome the Spanish and so there was this um, this desire to to dismant dismantle the Spanish Empire and all sorts of just like today you know we we fill the airways with ideas and notions about Muslims and and this and that you know and you, you think of somebody and they're supposed to be this or that because of what society has been saying or uh, describing and even the the language used sometimes suggests what you ought to be thinking in order to understand that kind of reasoning. So there's all sorts of levels of propaganda uh, that come in, even when you're sometimes subliminal propaganda can be in the form of trying to very, uh, very pedantically trying to uh, explain how these people are all so good, for example. And when you're saying, oh, these people are all so good, and look, they also have theaters, and look, they also have sciences, what the person that's listening is actually learning is that I ought to realize that they would be challenged, they would be, uh, it should surprise us that they have theater, and so. And so there are many levels that we actually hint, we hint at and we talk about contemporarily of how subliminally we get educated about other people and one of the things that the Leyenda Negra, the, the, the black tale, of, uh, is uh, sort of bringing to light in, through revisionism is what the British actually wanted to do to the, the Spanish colonies and, and the, these whole fronts, just like America presents fronts about what they actually want to do in Afghanistan or Iraq or Sudan or Bolivia or Venezuela uh, so did the British uh, present fronts uh, in what how, what they wanted to do to the Spanish uh, vice royalties, which were extensions of the Spanish Empire, and they too they wanted to catch up with America because all these ideas of the French Revolution were um, were um, were popular and hot, you know, and they were sweeping across the um, North America and the Caribbean. And so the the and the the, the the Hispanic nations wanted to also uh, have their wars of independence and and you know but really we have a different history. Um, for example, because of Catholicism, the the kings of Spain, they really uh, there was slavery uh, of the Indians of the natives as much as maybe in the states. You know the times had everybody change simultaneously at different times but it was like it's like a wave history uh, how history changes uh, our countries is like a wave and then there was still a little bit of this left over here and while well, they weren't doing that there anymore they were also starting to not do it anymore and, uh, but all in all you could generalize that the the English wanted to uh, have their territories, their colonies work, produce, and so they objectified the natives and they, they compensated or um, motivated them with earnings, but really they ended up enslaving them in, 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 in ways. Um, and 
while the Spanish, and this the revisionists are trying to teach this, the Spanish wanted um, wanted uh, to the Indians to understand that they were equal uh, before God to as anybody else. So they they had rights. For example, there were particularities that Indian an Indian a Native American uh, a Native American in a Spanish territory would be viewed could come to Europe as a Spanish citizen and uh, you know there were things that made the Spanish very different in how they went about the natives and although there were common things there were also fundamental and essential aspects that were very intrinsically different between the Spanish uh, and the, and the British and how they treated the natives, the indigenous people of, of the Americas, and as a result, you, um, you you for example, the Spanish went out of their way to 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 spread the idea of spreading Catholicism or the, you know Christianity was also a way of universalizing and, and expanding European culture, the progress of humanity to other to all people. And the British weren't so much into that. They were more into like let them do whatever they want. Let we want let them let us get what we need from them. And and so as a result, um, you have our early histories, uh, especially our early early histories, contrast uh, very very deeply. Um, I mean, there, there's like the and the abolition of slavery kind of happened around the West, more or less in the same as a, as a as the same movement at different times with the with a separation of a few decades, not more than that. Uh, but the way people were, which had to do more with their purpose of 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 the culture of the religion behind the culture, was very different. Um, there were no, for example. Uh, concentration camps in the sense of um, reser reservations, for example, in the Spanish countries. Where the people lived and they kind of mingled and they became very mixed, as we see. Uh, the Spanish are very mixed because the people didn't have, they were different about it. They didn't uh, segregate so much. So what we inherited today is not, is also something that comes culturally that our European parents brought over with their way of being because of how they were taught by their religions or their moral, uh, you know, uh, world of, 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 of schools of thought and how they, they thought so differently, the Spanish and the British. And so that's why, um, that's what made these two cultures so different in the Americas. But what I learned from coming back to the States and seeing that we, we uh, it, you know, that we were wrestling with how to not be racist or was the fact that we were identifying something that we've always tended to create. Um, so, in other words, what and, and and you know, and then I would go, for example, I would go to a social office and I would fill a form for some kind of assistance or something, and um, some welfare office, and then you'd see like these forms that have all the boxes and categories, and I would notice that we didn't have that in Argentina. Like you would say, well, we're a family of how many, and grandparent, my grandparents live at home, and. So that would be the form that you filled out to get help from the state. Um, how many kids, and how many kids are in school and university, and how many are are still in high school, and who's no longer in high school and working instead. You know, other kinds of structures that were required by the government to understand. Where I would go to the states and I'd see what is up here you know <laughs> everything has to do with what category are you what race are you what race are you what race are you constantly and what i finally ended up learning was we create what we're trying to undo we create what we're trying to not be i mean how can you say don't be racist if you if you're 
needing to refer to somebody by calling them white or black or Japanese. You know, it's like it's it's what the inference is that you black don't look at people for the color of their skin. You Japanese don't look at people. So there's a whole um, there's a whole a tail a dog catching its own tail situation that makes it impossible for it to disappear basically. Um, and this makes sense when you look at when I when you contrast these two cultures that have been evolving in the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere in that the Latin Americans had it easier because they never really identified a problem even though they may have humanly uh, and, and I'm going to get to this, I'm going to get to why it is simply a human social natural thing that can arise and so what we need to pay attention is what we educate to ourselves to think about and how we educate ourselves to think about it when or were we to identify it as a social problem. I mean, you, there's no doubt that in Latin America you see that the, um, that the wealthy are lighter skinned or they, may, they tend to predominantly come more from European families. But this is not a problem that that um, couldn't be described by saying because they're white they are racist which is kind of what America concludes uh, it started by accusing white people of being racist and so it's almost like then it becomes a hot potato you start <laughs> throwing it over to the other one and there was never really any potato the problem is that we simply resort to what is easiest to identify. If we are happy and, for example, in Argentina you, you, you call your friend mi amigo el polaco, my friend the Polish. Um, and Polak, Polish is, a, is not a, an adjective as such, it's also somebody of Polish, of Polish production. You know, it's a different um, a semantic to to the so that's why it works as a we use it we use it to say chubs for example somebody who's your best friend and who's chubby or heavy you call them to you know we we do it in the states too but it's not very it's not very used uh while in argentina and and, and hispanic countries yeah you say negro vení which means black come over here but in english it sounds horrible in spanish it sounds my friend, come over here. It's completely different. Um, so, it, it, this happens, or this is able to be as such, because really, like kids teach us, like I was with my little friend, where I saw her hair and I just kind of went for it and pulled it and we both smiled at each other. Uh, we will say and notice what we see. There's, there, just because we're able to say what we see in somebody else's face or somebody else's hair doesn't mean that it will be bad. But because we created a, an ideological subject in the States, we have been for several generations now growing up thinking of such identification as something that is uh, bad to do. And so we've created, we put ourselves in a very tight and uncomfortable place because it goes against what would otherwise be natural to call each other for something we see. Now, we have to understand that when, for example, an Argentina gets mad and calls and says somebody, I don't know why I struggled to say that before, you fucking black, in other words. Um, we are responding to anger. Anger, the intelligence or the reasoning of anger, moves swifter, faster. It wants to defend. It wants to get out of trouble. It wants to flight or fight or flight. Right? It's it's a sharp thing that needs to move logic quickly, and so it resorts to answering rapidly. For example, when you get angry at somebody, you it's almost like you're looking at them when you're pissed off for other reasons, for human reasons, because they were unfair or unjust, or they took your your girlfriend, or or they cheated uh, on you, they cheated you on some business. 
you, you have a, a human reason you're angry for them or because they abuse or they moved into your neighborhood or whatever it is. It's a human source of, um, of, 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 of anger, of being upset, a reason. The reason is human. It has nothing to do with what we look like. But in the moment of expressing and venting our anger, that reasoning has to move quickly. My dog is bored, of course. It's not, it doesn't concern her. Um, show how bored you are, honey. Yeah, yeah, she's bored. Okay. Um, at that moment, fight becomes uh, fast. And so you look at somebody like a boxer. What can I say rapidly? Where can I find a stone to throw at that person? Because I'm emotionally humanly angry and what hits you the the fastest is something personal that is obvious about that other if that person instead of being black or japanese or polish was short you would go you 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 stupid midget <laughs> okay so that there's actually no difference between saying you fucking black and you stupid midget because I'm angry for a human reason, and I just resorted to the first thing that visually I could throw at you. Okay? So, we have to understand that that's why that happens. And, therefore, it takes us to realize that we are being human with each other. We actually never not start seeing each other as another human being, just like children do. But, as adults, because we've got to be so smart, and we've got to reinvent everything, we've got to reinvent a man, and we've got to reinvent a woman, and we've got to reinvent everything, we have seen something that was bothering us, and we had to wrestle our logic and try to res resolve this problem, you know? And we identified racism, and racism, blah, 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 blah. And so, and yeah, look, see, see, look, they're saying black, they're saying black, they're saying white, they're saying Japanese. It is... The problem is racism, is that they are saying those words um, and, and hurting, and they say it because they hate each other for being those colors or those races, and so we see clearly a problem, and we're going to call it racism, and we created the social issue of racism, and we talk about it, we went to town with it, we're going, we're writing everywhere, racism, this, and I'm going to fix racism, and we created, it actually doesn't exist. Racism actually doesn't exist as something that would come forth from our human soul, from our human heart. We will, what matters to us is what you do as another human being. That always matters first. But, by our precociousness, having invented this system of reasoning, of an identified problem, what we do is we teach each subsequent generation to go look for it. I also learned this, for example, in Hawaii, which broke my heart. I was in love with Hawaii. I, I got there and I saw waterfalls and rainbows. It was, oh, you know, like those those thirty movies with a with a choir of of, of tropical women come sort of that choir coming from behind the waterfall. <laughs> it was beautiful, and of course the people. I had to know them. I had to get to know them, and I was I was going to get to know them, and I was really going to be like their their little adopted son, you know, and so everything was beautiful. And it went from beautiful to like getting beat up 10 years in, at the end, uh, you know, it <laughs> was the ugliest. And I saw how much segregation quiet, quieted, nobody wants to talk about it, nobody wants to say the elephant that's in the room, and you see beaches were full of Hawaiians, and beaches where the whites go, and if a uh, Hawaiian walks in there, he's like the king. All the whites kind of move aside. Welcome to your beach, you know, where we all are, <laughs> where all us whites are. You're welcome. Go sit over there. Go right ahead, you know. But where if you go to a Hawaiian beach, it's like dirty looks. Hmm, what's he doing here? Hmm, yeah. <laughs> this is all over Hawaii. Don't tell me there is no deep set seated. I know it. Because when you pay attention and you're interested in these subjects, what do you see? The, the Hawaiian dad, you know, holding his little boy at the Walmart, his little five-year-old boy, and his little, what, his little five-year-old boy is looking at me with my 
hippie hair and all my stuff. Just like I and my little girlfriend in West Hollywood were just like, what do we do now, right? He was looking at me like, wow, look at look at these guys, how they dress with all that color and those 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 uh, uh, fabrics and stuff, right? And his dad pulls his arm and says, no, be looking at no howly. Don't be looking at no white man. So right away, the children are, oh, okay, I learn, daddy, I learn, I learn. Whatever you adults say is what I'm going to be because I learn from the world as I'm growing up. And so we teach them, we teach our kids that there's racist. We teach our kids in seventh grade that they ought not to be racist. And they're going, oh, I'm, I, I, I was racist? I didn't, what is that? Can you explain to me so that then I can later fix it? Because first you got to teach me what it is. <laughs> the children is, are probably thinking in their, in their beautiful minds that we ruin, right? So this is the actual crux of, this, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the problem. We are in a situation where we will become what we teach, our, how we teach ourselves to think. It's almost like trying to get out of the mud, where you use one foot to pull the other foot out. And so, what? How do you do it? You know, how do you? You just go to the street, and that's that's why I said to myself, okay, I'll just do my little two cents, and I will stop calling people black or African American, and always giving a category. No. If I have to refer to somebody, make it easy for somebody to know who I'm talking about, or, or why did they find themselves in that situation, or what have you, uh, because what you'll find is that most things that you got to talk about, usually only are getting are talked are being talked about for human reasons, and human reasons, 99% of the chance do not uh, relate or involve your your skin, or you know, so if you really start condensing it, condensing it to where does it matter to act, where does it actually concern or relate to the your ethnical racial appearance, you'll find that it's actually like 5% of what we have culturally become accustomed to talking like. Um, so it is a difficult endeavor right there because you have to make a conscious effort, but the prescription would be like walking out of the mud to not teach our children to think in terms of identifying people's categories you know to not think of people first think of people and then think of all the things that people can be and be angry they can be kind they can be smart and quick and they can be kind of pondering and not so quick you know and they can be exciting and or sometimes they're quiet and you have to do all the all the talking and you know you can talk about people you can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and never need to mention or or, or think about that because of that race so children need to grow up in that world for racism the racism that we have created to disappear <laughs> it's that simple we're not gonna fix it by t teaching people to not do it, because by teaching them to not do what they ne they they don't br they didn't bring with them, we're reinstalling and replanting the problem, like the dog trying to catch its tail, and we can't come out of it. And worse yet, and this this kind of touches me personally, is that because we believe in fixing the world and you know and doing the making. Uh, all these problems and resolved by creating all these categories, and now we have transgender, and we have L B G Q for, for rights, and we have da 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 da, and then they learn it, and they treat women this way, da 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 da, and treat women, you know, all this stuff that we're instructing people how to be people through. We're exporting it through our communication medias, and what I am finding out when I. I go when every time I go back to Argentina, which is now like a ten-year lapse, is that I hear these young Argentinians are saying, "Hey, you know, look, you know, we're becoming modern. We're becoming more like the the Western kind of progressive world." I have Afro-Argentinian friends, and I you have what? Yeah, I, I have. These are my Afro-Argentinian friends. I never heard that combination put before ever until I saw a video that 
you know, and you look at these new videos and they look like literal translations of videos made in English 10 years before. And then I see, for example, that Argentina really, you know, we taught our kids that the, the Spanish did horrible things to the Indians and it's not like they were ever trying to hide it. But when you would go and maybe travel to the south of Argentina, over there by the border with Chile and, and the beautiful Andes, and all of a sudden you, you met people that looked very indigenous, you would look at them, and if you were a child 40, 50 years ago, you would go, oh, look at what a dark Argentinian. You wouldn't think there is a Mapuche. <laughs> you would think, well, that Argentinian, mom, why are those Argentinian in the head, the little boy is thinking, is so dark. And so the mom would say, oh, because he descends from Mapuches, right? Okay, or from whatever. And so things were healthier because the people were united under one country. Now, <laughs> now you have these stupid, like, pushes that, uh, that, you know, the, the Mapuche nation took a complete invention. There was never a Mapuche nation. The Mapuches were, like, immigrated into other tribes, and they were mainly concentrated on the Chilean side. And now they're just coming out with oh, all sorts of things, you know. Or, you know, you took away... They were, anyways, I'm going to get into that subject. But what I find very interesting is that it... They, they're getting money, some of the more aggressive ones, that say, we're taking over this town, and, you know, and we'll, they vandalize this or that. It's problems we never had before. Well, wouldn't you know that they're getting money from a human rights agency in Bristol, England? Wow. The same culture that put Native Americans in concentration camps in the States wants to create a problem, a modern version of the same thing. And, you know, and the Argentines are going nuts because many are educated enough to understand some complexities at, in the popular general level. And they see what the same thing I'm seeing, that there are now, the something is trying to create problems that weren't here before. <laughs> that there wasn't, uh, you know, uh, the, the Argentinian character would have never would have always maintained a pers a proper set of perspectives and values that were a transgendered person to freakishly want to also prove to himself that he can be a mother and so he would adopt children. He would have never seen that person. You know, they would probably feel they needed to bury themselves naturally by self-imposition in some cave because it was so such a disparity to anything that was a natural construction of natural social fabric, you know, that it would have had a proportional um, form equal to that, very rarely that person being observed by anybody. Instead, I, I went back once to see where this transgendered man working as a female uh person adopted two children and brought it on brought them on to a late night uh, variety TV show sort of like Conan O'Brien run by a female or something like that with it's two ba with his two babies and she's a female she, you know but anyway I I'm gonna say he babies on on set I mean they, we would have not even done that in the states. You know what I mean? We still kind of, some things are still holding. Um, but when a country, when countries started off by already sort of 50% betraying their own sense of self and letting British interventions do stuff to their... They, these are cultures that already started with, with an aspect of we are tied to, we depend on, we need the British or the Americans or we're coming after them or following them, we're trying to copy them or we have to learn from them. And so there's always this aspect of, of a, a, a weak half that gets filled in immediately by liberal capitalists who want to immediately be best friends 
with Tom, with Donald Trump, and and all of a sudden they're like the Malvinas. We don't care about the Malvinas, you know. Just let us do business with you again. They say to London, and they betray their claim of sovereign, two hundred year old claim of sovereignty to these islands because the British blackmail them and say, "We'll be your friends if you stop bugging us with that," you know. And so all of a sudden there's a government that is pro. We don't have this problem in America where we take turns between governments that are all about nationalist protectionist self do what you know you know do what's good for us and then the next government all of a sudden be oh well we're just going to do the, what the french do we we have to you know hurry up and catch up to the french and then oh did you hear the latest idea that came from france and you know that you are you aware that this is what the French are doing and we've got to hurry up and change it to that system because that's what the French use and then and then we go back to uh, no America is what matters let's do it here you know we don't have that oscillation problem that Latin American countries do and it is because the British immediately took advantage that they were uh, needing uh, they thought they needed to war each other or they were the same culture the same people they had the same currency all of a sudden, they, they had the same currency. They had Their currency was valued in China. They were an empire. They were, part, they were Spain, you know. And so uh, this is the part that history doesn't teach you. But, the, you know, the British went and made sure that they became small nations with de different currencies. And they all took out loans from, from uh, I forgot the name of the British bank. Anyways, and so that sort of set started them off on a on a uh, a different kind of sense of self a hybrid sense of self independent but uh we are being made by europe and we need england and then we need america and, and this toggle keeps happening and anyways i, I don't want to divert uh i totally diverted I, I didn't want to but i did um it's very interesting but what what is what is important is that we don't create problems that we wouldn't have and it you know we are one people always we think of e we think and we met we matter first in our motivation in our heart in our soul uh, what will touch us what we will care about always starts in the same human being recognized in anybody chinese black white white it was an invention that came from from needing to find <laughs> <laughs> to not be racist, you know, so, so that it wasn't only one group of people called what obviously seemed to stand out, so then we had to create white so that everybody was now happily in a category, and we just continue messing things up. Um, my dog wants to go out. Okay. Um, and we are one nation. What is this? In, in, in the States... We are pretty together, integral in the sense that we don't compromise our our wholeness, but we're completely split in a polarity uh, tug of war between socialism and capitalism, or right and left, or Republican and Democrat, and um, and that was also exported to Latin America. It's the first one. Latin America is the first one to buy whatever they're doing. It, it's got to be right, you know. Abortion, let's do it too. Gay rights, let's do it too, you know. <laughs> Transsexual gender ideology, well, let's do that too, you know. And then they, they do their own little green hanky chip and handkerchief and they call themselves or whatever. But anyways, um, they are kind of, they are adopting the same, I mean, you know, when I when I get into groups that are arguing in Venezuela, for example, and I hear Venezuelans um, say, we will never give in to communism and, you know, so, socialism ruins countries and makes countries poor. Uh, I really, I, you know, it's like, I know you guys. We, you know, I, we speak the same language. I know. That sounds like you got it from somewhere. That sounds like you picked it up. You believed it. You probably believed it by from somebody else that speaks your language too. But I'll bet you anything that somewhere down the line, that person read it or learned it from something that was translated from a Newsweek, from 
a political scholar from Boston or from, you know, <laughs> some politician from North Carolina and his thing was translated into a publication in Columbia or it, it's all learned stuff and I can see it just by knowing just by knowing the, the spirit of the people when something quickly changes and you know it came from elsewhere and then if, you know, I think I turned the channel and there was Trump saying we will never be socialists you know okay <laughs> say no more I know where that came from it's like can you be yourselves you know can you try to be yourselves and being ourselves really means not being split in, in, in a bipolar, uh, a, bi a, a, a polarized situation because, and I'll, I'll be quick about this, I'll try to do this before the hour's up. Um, if, a, if, a, if a people start grouping and separating the nation in a polarized in polarized uh, ideological context of politics it probably is because we find it easier to to find an enemy and have something to fight against that's kind of like it, evolution did that to us and um, it can also be explained but basically we need to understand that we're responding to a setup, a wiring of, of, of human nature that makes us find the easy way to stay in the fight, to feel worthy and feel useful and feel like I'm winning and feel like I know what I'm talking about or I'm learning or I understand. And uh, in, in the agitation of, re of needing to resolve something, the binary situation of taking a position and finding your target enemy comes fastest and easiest to the human mind and that's why countries will easily fall into polar, polarized situations and then look for explanations and just and reasons that explain why that is true why that is the way it is and it doesn't help that uh, we have a big country with a couple of mega loudspeakers telling the world how to think about your sexuality how to think about politics what the real values of a good nature, a good na uh, nation are, and you know, spreading that in their loudspeakers, of course. And you're Latin America, looking, okay, okay, okay. I, I was just about to do what you said, you know. In a matter of years, um, they're doing the same thing. They're they they don't have li uh, Democrats and Republicans. They have Labor Party and liberal capitalists or radicals or what have you. But basically they do the same thing they then they start so you know we need to realize that a, a nation is the organism uh, the government is the brain that is going to try to administrate that nation for it for human for it to fit human beings and that means that we should be able to change different understandings of administration very fluidly they can't be there could never be just a, a two formulas for administrating a nation no because we have been getting it wrong forever <laughs> we have had this equality and in inadequateness and failure constant failure poverty criminal social problems uh, you know, it's we've never had an excellent nation where everybody, you know, maybe now we think that Sweden and, and Norway are, are finally, you know, the first nations to start actually eliminating all their problems and then all of a sudden they, they tell you they're bored to death and, you know, they don't know what to do with themselves. It's not true, you know. It's not, but I'm trying to make a joke. Um to the point of, uh, to the effect of having us realize that to fall into a polarized um, con context of thinking about government is like wearing handcuffs because all of a sudden you lose sight of the brain of the country, the government, what you need to continue feeding and changing and seeing how to improve because we've only shown failure in human history so far uh, and 
obsess with pulling from the other hand, with the other end of the handcuff is. And pretty soon our existence becomes a tug of war, which we see, all we got to do is turn on the TV and we see it, a tug of war between two school, schools of, uh, two, two camps basically. And then we create complexities to make it seem mature, adult, and serious, but really uh, we're just like parrots repeating what we, th what we think is smart because somebody else sounded smart when they said it. And we're not changing and what we're actually doing is allowing people who are smarter, who, who know that there's another dimension that you have to move through, and as a result, you have people like Bloomberg and, and Ms. Clinton saying that they're Democrats for the people, right? But in reality, they're status quo, they're, they're supporting, and they want to be in there with the guys that used to represent and are still probably, you know, there's no more Republican and Democrats, and we're also talking about that. These, that's, that was just... The, the handcuffs themselves can never even hold because um, even we confine ourselves to our hard inventions, our, our engineering of, of a failing human intelligence, and we will shed it because we want to be free. And we don't even realize that we had the power to design those shells, those administrative inventions, those mechanisms much more organically, flexibly, versatilely, we could have uh, had, we could have designed a government that says, okay, we always got to have minimal three parties or five parties, and they could never be more powerful than the other. And then we, all schools of thought that have, that are uh, attempting to more intelligently govern a nation will find their place in these different, these five parties that may maintain their same names or may change their names as time goes forward but basically what we want to secure is for us to not fall into two gutters that later blind people and have other smarter people quietly start pulling and grabbing all the power and trying to maintain this appearance of these two parties fighting against each other I don't know how I, 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 I left so easily the subject that mattered that I wanted to talk about. Uh, I guess because it's so simple. We just basically have to talk, stop thinking of others for their skin color. It's really that simple. We simply have to, when we want, as a culture, as a country, as, as whatever sociological discourse, even our sociological discourses, even our demographical, everything has to become about people. Uh, because we don't, we, we, we shouldn't even think that recognizing that it would be maybe difficult at this point has any validity. We shouldn't see, we should realize that it has no validity because in reality people, in their deepest of hearts, are first always thinking of people. And then we resort to, wait a second, I'm supposed to be thinking this way. And we recapture everything that the world and our parents and our friends have been teaching us for 50 years, and we repeat it and we repeat it and we rehash everything that we believe we understand. We have structured uh, perfectly our understanding according to, right? But in reality, no matter how old you are, we're still first thinking and it, what first matters when the chips are down is how that person behaves as a person. And then we, when we try to explain it, well, it's because they're white, you know, they did that. But, okay, that's what culture and society has been teaching us since we're children. We have to somehow make our society be better even than the Brazil and the Argentina I remember of when I was a kid. We, we have to find a way of really only thinking of people and no longer looking for, uh, you know, finding as much as possible every way to get rid of every reference to skin color and develop the arguments that understand society and human sciences according to what matters to people. And 
there would be so much work that we would just be busy we would have so much to do and we wouldn't have time to even complain about how difficult it might be okay that's my little two cents ciao